I spoke about the first part. I just give you a brief resume about the first part. Witness Elijah, and you will witness what role you are to play in the present times. Elijah said there will be no rain for three years. Our Lord, when he related this incident in Luke chapter 4, said not three years, but three and a half years there was no rain. Is there a conflict, therefore, between what Elijah said and what our Lord said? No, there isn't. It only means that already for half year, six months, there had been no rain or drought. People may have thought it is a normal thing. It will come. But Elijah, being sharp and knowing God's way, he sensed immediately because people had fallen away from their faith Already it was operating. What was said in Deuteronomy is operating, and Deuteronomy had said that when people turn away from God, there is going to be no rain, be famine for years, two years, three years, four years. So, therefore, he sensed what is coming. We are in the shoes of Elijah. Having seen what has happened all over the world, and the world happily thinks this is a passing phase, it will all be over. We, like Elijah, are sharp enough to realize that this is not going to pass off. This is the beginning of something bigger. So therefore, what did Elijah do? He went straight to the ruler and he warned and proclaimed. And that's what we are called to do, to warn and proclaim. And that's what we've been doing. Then there's a time for us to retire to our respective refuges. That's what, having proclaimed, the Lord said, now go and hide yourself. And he is the one who provided a refuge to Elijah. And he said, once you go there, I'm going to provide for you. He provided through a raven first. Uh, in fact, upsetting the raven's nature because a raven never knows to share or give. If you Google a raven, you will see the foremost feature of a raven is it robs robs from others. But here is the raven which is to give. So God can change the nature of a person. Okay? Then we just going by it, the, the Lord next told him, now move from that refuge, go to Zarephath. And there, there will be a lady who is a widow. He didn't know who is the lady, but he went. And I have described again in the first talk how systematically he followed the instructions of the Lord. And the woman, who of course had no faith, because she did not know the Judaism religion at all, but yet she obeyed, and she yet she believed and did. When he said, he said, make a meal and give to me first, she did it. No, what is relevant there is, he said, yes, I know the problems you have, but make a small loaf for me first. I highlight that word first because it is in line with what we have been saying. The first place to God and he will add the rest. It's exactly what happened. When she made first, despite all her problems, she made first provision for Elijah, symbolizing here the Lord, the Lord provided everything else. Now I take you further from verse number 16 onwards. We saw that the fact that she believed, she gave first place to what the prophet, the man of God told. She gave first place to God. God provided the rest. Now, let's go directly to verse number 16. As the Lord had promised through Elijah, the bowl did not run out of flour, nor did the jar run out of oil. Verse number 17. Sometime later, the widow's son got sick. He got worse and worse, and finally he died. Next, she said to Elijah, man of God, why did you do this to me? Did you come here to remind God of my sins and so cause my son's death? Next, give the boy to me, Elijah said. He took the boy from her arms carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying, and laid him on the bed. Next. 
Then he prayed aloud, O Lord my God, why have you done such a terrible thing to this widow? She has been kind enough to take care of me, and now you kill her son. Then Elijah stretched himself out on the boy three times and prayed, O Lord my God, restore this child to life. The Lord answered Elijah's prayer. The child started breathing again and revived. Elijah took the boy back downstairs to his mother and said to her, Look, your son is alive. And finally she answered, Now I know you are a man of God and the Lord really speaks through you. Now having taken you through the whole passage, I revert back to the end of our story, which was in the last talk. Therefore, verse number 16 is important. And verse number 16 says, As the Lord had promised through Elijah, the bowl did not run out of flour, nor the jar run out of oil. Kindly underline the words flour and oil. Now, materially speaking, we are talking of flour, and oil, which was multiplied, that's how they survived. Spiritual speaking, the flour is nothing else but the grain which is powdered and symbolizes our Lord who allowed himself to be crushed and powdered for our sake. He became the flour. As our Lord himself said, if a grain of wheat just remains alone, it will just be alone by itself, it's of no use. But unless it falls to the ground and dies, our Lord allowed himself as the wheat to be crushed into flour. And the jar of oil, oil as you know, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. So you get two very clear indications. Throughout the difficult times, these two things are not going to fail us. That is our Lord Himself and the Holy Spirit. These two are a supernatural source of strength. I am further confirmed in this, if I look at the book of Leviticus, which speaks about flower. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse number 1 reads as follows. When any of you present an offering of grain to the Lord, you must first grind it into flour. Look at that. You must first grind it into flour. Leviticus, thousands of years before Jesus came, was only showing a portrait of him who would allow himself to be ground and powdered and smashed and tormented for our sake. When any of you present an offering of grain to the Lord, you must first grind it into flour. The flour unmistakably, in the widow's case, refers and points to Jesus. You must put olive oil and incense on it. Maybe we can go a little further in Leviticus. Verse number 2 says, Bring it to the Aaronite priests. The officiating priest shall take a handful of the flour and oil and all of the incense, and burn it on the altar as a token that it has been offered to the Lord, and the odor of this food offering is pleasing to the Lord. Look at that, look at that. Now the similarity becomes very, very clear. The sacrifice the Lord made of himself, he allowed himself to be ground as a grain of wheat is ground into flour. That is the sacrifice alone which is pleasing to the Lord and reconciles us to the Lord. You can see it very clearly. The flower points to our Lord. Jesus would come. It is the oil symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Now if we go back, 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 16. As the Lord had promised to Elijah, the bowl did not run out of flour, nor did the jar run out of oil. Please underline again, flour and oil. If there is any doubt in my mind about what I just told you, that doubt is removed when I see that in this passage, exactly three times, not less, not more, the word flour and oil is mentioned. Three times, 
signifying the Trinity. The first time it occurs is verse number 12. She says, By the living Lord your God, I swear, I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a bowl. Please underline the word flour. And a bit of olive oil in a jar. Underline the word oil. She says, I came here to gather some firewood to take back home and prepare what little I have for my son and me. That will be our last meal, then we will starve to death. The words of a person who cannot really believe in what Jesus has done for us. So, okay, we believe, technically, from our mind, but we think the situation is hopeless. Will he be able to help us? Right now, this is the first time it is mentioned. The second time it's mentioned is in verse number 14. This is what the Lord God of Israel says, The bowl will not run out of flour, or the jar run out of oil, before the day that I, the Lord, send rain. This then is the second time. Please underline the word flour, underline the word oil. Second time. Occurring in verse number 14. Please put a circle around 14. Why this is important is, for me, and you know, in the Bible, 7 is the number of perfection. Only God is perfect. And God is a Trinitarian God. The second person of the Trinity is our, our Lord Jesus. So seven of the perfection of God and the second person of the Trinity, seven in two, fourteen. In fact, you will find in a whole number of lines in the Bible, which always chapter 14 or line number 14 invariably points to Jesus. But I'm not doing the study with you right now. You check out it for yourself and you will see. Number 14 invariably points to the Lord Jesus, as in this case. And here more so, because he's the second person of the Trinity, and this is the second time the word flour and oil is occurring. Now the third time it occurs is in the verse we took up at the beginning, 17 and verse number 16. As the Lord had promised to Elijah, the bowl did not run out of flour, nor did the jar run out of the oil. And if you underline that, you get exactly three times flour and oil. The Holy Spirit would not have done such a detailed dictation in the Holy Scriptures if the flour and oil did not point to indeed what we've explained, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Before I part with this, I would like to say that Please note that God's provision is daily. They had to go again and again. The Lord did not give them sacks of flour. He did not give them barrels of oil. Our Lord will never provide that way. We are expected to go to Him every day for a fresh outpouring of grace. There is no such thing as He will provide long term spiritual grace. Every day is a fresh effort. That is why I say, in our spiritual journey, don't be content, I just made a retreat, or I just went for some prayer meeting. No, every day. Don't we eat every day? Did we, do we eat for one day and, uh, and fast for a month? Never. We eat every day. Our Lord Himself said, give us this day our daily bread. Not only talking about physical food, but also spiritual food every day. No? So our Lord's provision is like this. I would also like to point out that in the passage that we just did, Elijah, though he was saved by the Lord, being a chosen man of God, the Lord told him, enter your refuge, I will provide food, the raven will come with food and provide water to the brook. Please note that at one stage the brook dried up. Verse number 7 says, after a while the brook dried up because of the lack of rain. This must be surprising, because the Lord said, I will provide for you. And He did provide, but after some time the brook dried up. We don't know how many days Elijah went without water, before the Lord said, okay, go to the widow 
of Zarephath. But we can certainly say Elijah got a taste of what the people of the world were going through. They were thirsty, they had no water, there was no rain, there was famine. It only indicates that we, the chosen people of God, though God will protect us, provide for us, we will also have a taste of some of the sufferings that the world will go through. Though with a difference. They will go through it because they did not believe. They turned away from God. We who believe in God will go through it. Just like Jesus participated in what were the fruits of sin. He went through that suffering. Though he himself did not deserve it. We are in the same shoes as our Lord. So we will experience partly the war, the effects of famine, the effects of price rise, persecution, other things, be sure of it. You see today's passage, the continuation of it, which indicates a death to the widow's son, is a shock. Elijah was allowed to face it. He himself was protected, but he was allowed to face it. Why? So that he could get a taste of how much death can pain a human being. Our Lord himself had a taste of it when he saw what the death of Lazarus did to Mary and Martha. He cried. In fact, this is the only recorded scripture which says that our Lord wept. He didn't have to weep, I say, because he was going to raise him. Anyway, he knew he was going to raise him. But be very clear, our Lord wept because he was one with what we feel. That is our God. He is one with what we feel. That's the difference between Jesus and anyone else. Jesus can feel what you're going through as if wearing your own shoes. He can understand you at that level. If only we had a personal relationship with the Lord. Oh my God, if only, if only we had a personal relationship with our Lord. We would know how deep it goes. It's not just words. It's not just theory but it is something very deep. So now how did this experience of death come about from the widow of Zarephath? For that we have to go to see 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 17. Sometime later the widow's son got sick, he got worse and worse and finally died. Often it is of advantage if you compare the various versions of the Bible, because this version is the good news version which you have, and it would appear that the son of the widow got sick and he progressively worsened. But however, when I compare it to the other versions of the Bible, I get the impression that the sickness did not systematically become worse, but it was quite fast. In fact, he got sick. In a short time, it became critical, he died. That's the impression I get. Come with me and see the other versions of this line. Now, this is the New Jerusalem Bible, please note. It happened after this, the son of the mistress of the house fell sick. His illness was so severe, in the end he expired. Look at this. So, it was not a stretched out thing. I say this because... Probably Elijah did not even get a chance to pray over him. Probably she never even had the chance to tell Elijah, see, look, he's worsening and worsening. Now it's a month, he's sick. Please pray over him. No, it was something that came suddenly. And you must understand, things happen in our life also suddenly. A sudden death, an accident, a sudden sickness, a COVID death. Some things happen suddenly. Please understand that. Show some more versions of the Bible. The RSV version says like this. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe, there was no breath left in him. So you see, very often when you compare, you get the actual thing. So it was sudden. Now, that made the problem even worse. Death is even otherwise bad. It paralyzes a person. Even a person strong in the faith can be paralyzed. 
If today you find by the morning your spouse has expired or your son or your daughter is taken away, you and I, though we are men and women of faith, will be shaken. Understand what the widow went through. As it is, she had undergone one tragedy in her life. Her husband had died. She was a widow. And now the only purpose she was living was probably the son. And now the purpose of her life was taken away. Can you understand? And suddenly, rather, suddenly he disappeared. So understand the predicament of the widow. Let us not be too cruel on her saying that she had no faith. Maybe she did not have faith. But is there a difference in the way that we would have behaved if put in the same shoes? She realized that there's no one to carry forth the generation of her husband now. The generation had come to an end. The only person who could have done it was her son and he's also taken away. At that moment, she must have thought, what am I living for? And it was worse, as I said, because it was all sudden. Now, having said this, you must understand that the widow had done a service to the man of God. She had provided for Elijah. And she must have thought that she will be rewarded for it. Indeed, she was rewarded. Service to our Lord is always rewarded. She was rewarded. Where others were dying of famine, she had enough of flour, enough of oil, enough of food for a long time. But she went in the error of believing that this is the thing, never bad things will happen in my life. The common error that we do. Now listen to this, as long as we are in the flesh, there will always be afflictions. Afflictions will always come, as long as we are in the flesh. Even if we are serving the Lord. But the Lord always turns it to our good in the end. Remember that. A sudden accident takes place. The child suddenly falls sick and within two days is dead. No, still the Lord can change it to our good. So, therefore, in the case of this woman, she didn't see any good in it. How could she see? The very reason for her life had gone. And on top of that, that was the end of her husband's name and generation. She had no reason to live. But she went into the error of thinking that now that I have done a good deed to God or to a man of God, everything is always going to be fine. Let us never enter into that error. It's a good thing to serve the Lord and the Lord will always reward us. But never think it is a permanent insurance against affliction in this life. Will come, there may be sudden loss of income, a loss of a job, could come in the form of sickness. As I said, accident, disaster, affliction is part of it. No, as uh, Saint Peter says, he says, whenever trials come, never get discouraged. Never get discouraged. Know that the Lord is working through the trial also. If you show them 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse number 12. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful tests you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. Don't be surprised when sudden trials come. And I must add here and say that the Lord normally always blesses enriches and strengthens us a lot before allowing something not so favorable to happen in our lives. He always strengthens for us, He blesses. So often you see, there's a time of prosperity, a time of goodness, and then suddenly things become bad. No, even in that situation, He is disciplining us. He's using that situation to chastise us. He's using that situation to correct us so that we can advance towards holiness. As the letter to the Hebrews says, chapter 12, verse number 7 says like this, Endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. 
Your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? Please underline the last question. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? So there it is. Afflictions are bound to be there as long as we are alive. But understand the purpose. The devil wants to numbers, discourage us and knock us out. God, on the other hand, is using the same affliction to chastise us, to purify us, to help us learn and advance in the matters of holiness. Chastise is the, the scolding, the whipping, the disciplining which a father gives. Maybe you would like to show me other versions of this same line. Perseverance is part of your training. God is treating you as a son. Has there ever been a son whose father did not train him? It's the New Jerusalem version. Show me the RSV version. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as his children. What child is there whom a parent does not discipline? This is important. Look at whatever happens as a matter of discipline. No? A man without faith, a woman without faith will always say, why did this happen to me? I have done everything. Probably the widow said that. She said, I have done all good things to God, to God's servant, and look what has happened to us. No? This, let trials come and you'll see the difference between a man of faith and a man of no faith. You'll see the difference. That's the dividing line whenever trials come. No? The man of faith will always, always, no? Lord, you were, you were right. As Eli said, Eli the priest, when he called Samuel, and he asked Samuel, he said, Samuel, tell me what the Lord has shown you. Samuel was a small child. There was a lot of corruption going on even in the priesthood. Eli was a priest. A lot of corruption going on. And the Lord stopped talking and showing himself to Eli. And instead he appeared to Samuel, the young boy. And Eli called Samuel and said, Give me a true account of what the Lord has said. And Samuel, being truthful, tells him whatever the Lord said. And most of it is that the Lord says, I will deal with those who have corrupted the priesthood, etc. And Eli says, he says, whatever the Lord is doing, he knows best, it's a good. And this is the attitude of a man of faith, even when afflictions come. Suddenly bad things happen. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 18, this is what Eli said. When Samuel told him everything and did not keep anything back, Eli said, he is the Lord. He will do whatever seems best to him. Look at that. If you show us the RSV version, we may get an even better version. Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Look at this. This is a wonderful version. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. See? And this is what happens the attitude in a man of faith, even when bad things happen, it is the Lord, he knows. Let him do what seems good to him. Which means that a man of faith knows everything is in the control of the Lord. Good things as well as bad things. Of course, it's not easy to get a person who, like Job, can say, the Lord has given us good things. Let us praise him when he doesn't give us good things also. No, it's not easy. But this is where the division takes place and you can find out the difference between a true man of faith and a person who holds on to Jesus but in the times of affliction just turns and runs away and says that, Oh Lord, why you have done this? I have done so much for you and I don't deserve this. And look at the others around me. Nothing is happening to them but it's all happening to me. This is the superficial faith. The real man of faith will realize God, even through this, is disciplining me, is leading me to greater holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, 
verse number 11. When we are punished, it seems to us at that time something to make us sad, not glad. Later, however, those who have been disciplined by such punishment reap the peaceful reward of a righteous life. Look at that. Later, we realize. But a man of faith will realize when it happens itself. Though it may stun him, it may numb him, it may shock him. His attitude will always be, the Lord knows he's still in control. He will do whatever is best. Let him do whatever is good to him. No. And this is the same attitude that our Lord had also when he was here on planet Earth. Same attitude. No. The great division between a man, a woman of real faith and a man, a woman of faith, which is just superficial, not deep. No. So when you are a person of real faith, rather than saying, Lord, don't condemn me. What is this you have done to me? Instead of that, you'll say, Lord, point out where I have gone wrong because of which you are trying to discipline me now. Point out what is your specific charge against me? What is it that you want me to correct? Because of which you have allowed this thing to happen. No, as Job said in Job chapter 10 and verse number 2, you read like this Job chapter 10 and verse number 2, the words of Job Don't condemn me, God. Tell me what is the charge against me. Look at that. Don't condemn me, but tell me what is the charge against me. Just tell me where I have gone wrong. What is it that in my life you want me to be disciplined about? You want me to shed so that I can grow in holiness. And this is how a man of God, no, a woman of God will always have this sort of attitude. So affliction will always be there as long as we are alive. It is wrong to assume, as the widow of Zarephath assumed, that look, I have done so much to the Lord, so no bad thing should happen in my life. Wrong. Wrong. Afflictions will always be there and the Lord will use afflictions to discipline us. And often, as I told you, before an affliction comes and He allows it, He will shower us with all good things. Things that will lift us up, strengthen us, encourage us, and then will come the affliction. As I often tell my colleagues, after a high tide, there's always a low tide. So, and it happened also in the case of Joseph of the Old Testament. Now, as he rightly predicted, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And that's what it is. So understand the way God operates and you'll never get disappointed and angry with God. But you don't understand this and you'll be very active in the renewal. You'll come for prayer meetings. You'll be You'll be at the forefront of work for the Lord, but allow something bad to happen in your life. It will paralyze you. And often such people drop out. They're never seen again with the Lord. So be careful. Today's passage trains us in matters of life. And therefore, in this uh, connection, you can understand the outburst of the woman of Zarephath. She who does not have that kind of faith, she takes it out on the man of God. First of all, if you examine what she says in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 18, he said to Elijah, Man of God, why did you do this to me? Look at that. So first she treats him while she respects him as a man of God still. She says, you have brought bad luck to me. Isn't this what the Israelites said the moment problems came? And Moses was leading them across the desert. He had already led them across the Red Sea. They praised God. But the moment problems came, they said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? We were okay there even though we were suffering. Look at that. Man's attitude. So he takes it out on the Lord. No? Or he takes it out on the instruments of God. Why did you do this? I was better when I was not in the renewal. Now, see, I've come there. You know, how many times I've heard this even in counseling? No? I've been worse, and this is happening, and that is happening. Persevere, persevere. Hold on to the Lord. Everyone has gone through this trial. Don't think I've not gone through it. I've gone through it. But the grace of God enabled me to hold on. 
and slowly it passed off. The devil saw he cannot use any number of affliction to puncture and paralyze me. And my faith grew, holiness grew, intimacy with the Lord grew. No? Without the grace, I would have been finished. Look at her sentence. Man of God, why did you do this to me? She even questions his purpose. Did you come here to remind God of my sins and cause my son's death? Did you come here? Means simply she has forgotten that this man of God came and brought provisions and blessings for her. She has forgotten. This is what happens. We forget whatever good the Lord has done in our life. At the moment, at the point of affliction, at the point of suffering, we forget all that. Did you come here to remind God of my sins? Did you come here to cause my son's death? Look at that. No, She forgets that Elijah had come and he was a blessing. If he had not come, she would have probably died without any food. And look at that. Did you come to remind God of my sins? Which shows that after Elijah came to live in the house, this woman of God realized what past sins she had committed. This is what faith should do. She was not a woman of the Judaism religion yet. Looking of the man of faith, she realized. She realized what was right and what was wrong. You may not know till now, but now, as a result of some man of God, realize you are living in sin, etc. No? And that's what she realized. That's why she says, Did you come here to remind God of my sins? Probably she was referring to the sin of idolatry because they were worshipping at that time the god Baal. So she was referring, and that was eating into her that she had also worshipped Baal. So did you come to remind God of that sin? And so caused my son's death. Means her attitude towards God is, God is like a policeman waiting to finish me, waiting to find fault in me. It's natural, because she has not come into an intimate relationship with God. When you are not in an intimate relationship with God, you will always see God as marking time and having one eye on you, waiting to put you into a trap or into trouble. No, no, it's not at all right. And unfortunately, no amount of lectures or preaching can clear this. But when you experience God and have a God experience yourself and hold on to Him, you will see how faithful He is. He's not like that at all. No? But does God remind us of certain sins that we have committed when affliction comes? To that I say yes. Many times the Lord, through the affliction, makes us look back at what we think is our rightest life. Everything perfect, I'm doing so much for God. He makes us realize those things. That is why Our Lady said, she said, in the coming warning that will be coming, a worldwide warning that will be coming just before the worst days of the tribulation, people's conscience will be shaken. They'll realize that God has seen everything. And this was a kind of mini warning to the widow of Zarephath. It shook her terribly and the, it had the effect of reminding herself about her sins. So it is, I say yes, God does and can remind you of certain things which you are oblivious of because you are looking at your present status, your present life, your present service to the Lord and you have forgotten certain things of the past. You have forgotten that certain sins of the past also have implications which continue into your present life. So as I said, God is trying to purify you, make you more holy, so he allows it. It depends upon the attitude in which you take. As I said, if you are a man of belief, you will take it in the right way. Otherwise, you will be disappointed and rebel against God. Now, the verse number 19 shows you again the attitude of the man of God. Elijah, if I was in his place, would have reacted and would have certainly said, what do you mean by saying this? Because of me, you have got blessings. How can I bring bad luck? He could have said that, but look at this. This is the baby of a man of God. Gentleness, see? Gentleness. He doesn't retort, react. In how many families today there are quarrels because the spouses have not learned the secret of endurance. They react to anything. 
they react and a reaction leads to a counter reaction and there comes the quarrel there comes the ruining of peace in houses you know elijah see he avoided that he ignored it almost and see how with humility give the boy to me see just give the boy to me and took the boy from her arms he could have i just put myself in elijah's place i could have, i would have said see i did my best what can i do or i could have just gone and grabbed the the boy and tried to pray no he did it with gentleness he did it with humility see see the language give the boy to me he took the boy from her arms never retorted to her never reacted to her what did he do instead he said whatever i want to say privately i will say to my god see he doesn't even utter anything against god in front of her later you will see he will open his heart to his god but privately this is the behavior of a man of god a woman of god privately open your heart tell the lord whatever is troubling you no he took the boy from her arms carried him upstairs to the room which means he had prepared a room for him too this is so much like uh, his successor elisha also a man of god who would be given a room that time by the shunamite woman and there too the shunamite woman who prepares a room for the successor of elijah elisha she, her son also would die but before tragedy struck they you see the same symptom in the in that woman she had a good time god filled her with blessings and suddenly affliction came the son died so this is how god behaves and in each case he purifies us through it no he took the boy from her arms carried him upstairs to the room no upstairs because the room was quiet the room was private it was conducive to prayer upstairs also is a metaphorical meaning that when you talk to god you are taken from the earthly plane to a higher plane no i always say that whenever you are praying to god it is like entering an aeroplane and the the captain announces he says arm the doors the doors are closed from that moment onwards nothing can come in and no one can go out and when it the flight is over he'll say disarm the doors and the doors will be open again prayers like that you arm the doors no one else and then you on your flight with god you're talking to god that's what elijah did see he went up and then he burst open and look at how he addressed god in such a personal way look at this then he prayed aloud oh lord my god please underline the word oh lord my god see so personally he calls out to him why have you done such a terrible thing to this widow she has been kind enough to take care of me now you kill her son see all this is openly said but in private in private said to the lord no show them any other version this is the good news version he cried out to the lord look at that word he cried out where and in the privacy of his room cried out to the lord oh lord my god have you brought this calamity even upon the widow with whom i'm staying by killing her son so he chose even the man of god the bible shows some evidence of his humanity every person a human being is not expected to be imported from heaven we also have feelings but see he leaves it for private conversation oh lord have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom i'm staying by killing her son no i tend to believe this version rather than the good news version in this light the good news version says why have you done it but the other versions which are shown to me don't show the word why see have you brought calamity over her by killing her son she has been so good to me see how he addresses god he can understand sometimes things of god that shows that some the prophets won't know everything of course god guides them and tells them in advance but in this case you see it's very apparent that this death was not foretold to him 
in his successor elisha also you will see when the child of that uh, shunamite woman dies one of the first thing elisha says the lord did not even tell me about it so some things it's not that the prophet is a person who knows everything sometimes the lord will not but even in that in not telling him he's leading to events which will bring about his glory like it happened when lazarus died and jesus prolonged this stay did not go immediately for greater glory of god he raised him later no so like that he cried out to the lord for me this uh, sentence is very important oh lord my god it's so personal it's a cry to him lord only you can understand me why why has this happened how has this happened and see what it has done see verse number 21 says he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the lord look at that you have a repetition oh lord my god let this child's life come into him again which means you know it shows the child was dead it was not that the child just passed out no when you die your spirit leaves you the body remains even in the case of jesus when he uh, healed and restored that dead child people were crying no and the lord locks the door please not privately he works out this miracle he tells her to get up talitha calm he said talitha get up she was dead and her spirit returned in the spirit has left the body the spirit is commanded to return and come back and she got up and then he instructed them give her something to eat no so you see this is very clear this child was dead no and elijah before this not a single person dead person had been raised to life please note huh? in the bible not a single person had been raised but elijah believes the impossible can happen his god will not fail him he cried at oh lord my god let this child's life come back into him he stretched out three times well can you picture it three times he stretches out almost i get a replica of what happened at creation time when the father took mud from man and breathed it into his nostrils almost lying over it and life came to man look at that again the second person of the trinity jesus as someone said hanging on the cross it was as though he put himself on us and took all the blows for us on himself covered himself and kindly note this is indicating the action of our lord towards man that is why he stretched himself three times look earlier in the passage i told you three times mention of flour and oil here you have three times he stretched himself as though indicating this is what the lord had done for us on the very beginning always taking it upon himself giving of himself at creation he gave of himself and created man at the time of jesus he took man's sin upon himself stretched himself upon us three times and cried out oh lord my god let this child's life come back into him again and the next line says the lord listened to the voice of elijah the life of the child came back into him he revived look at that the life of the child which means the spirit which had left returned and he was alive again moment of rejoicing no but what does elijah do verse number 23 says elijah took the child brought him down from the upper chamber into the house which means from that supernatural level with the lord is descending now into the earthly level that's what prayer must be prayer is one level which i told you takes us above and then at a time we come back no brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and please note gave 
him to his mother. No? Gave him to his mother. I see the same kind of behavior in our Lord Jesus when he came and one day as he was approaching the town of Nain, a widow's son's funeral was taking place. He goes, touches the coffin and the dead man sits up. There too you find the same line. He gave the son back to his mother. Showing that he couldn't, he understands the pain of a widow. He understands the pain of a mother who has lost a child. He understands the pain of a parent who has lost their descendant. Give them back. You understand? No? And he says, see, your son is alive. He doesn't bother to broadcast, I did this, I did that, I prayed over him thrice. No. Here it is, your son is alive. Now at least he has a chance to say, look at what you spoke against me and all. Finally I brought your son back to me. No. You see gentleness in the prophet. In fact, a study of Elijah will show you that Elijah was always a man of temperament compared to his successor Elisha who was a cool guy. But this man of temperament, Elijah, see how gentle, despite provocation here, he doesn't react and see his behavior. See, your son is alive. And looking at this behavior, you see the reaction of the woman. In verse number 24, she says, the woman said to Elijah, Now I know you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord is in your mouth, is truth. Now I know means till now she only superficially knew. That's what always happens. We think we know it. We think we believe it, but it's only superficial. It takes a lot of experience to grip your heart and convict you to the soul about the word of God. For years and years, you can be enamored by your cerebrum. And your cerebrum, your brain feels so elated by what you hear. It's all intellectual faith. It helps you not. It helps you not. Faith has to percolate to the heart, convict you to the core, so that in bad times and in good, you stand by the cross. Now I know you are a man of God. Her faith has reached now that higher level. Even in the case of Moses, the Lord said, Moses had carried six lakh Israelites, led them out through the Red Sea. And the Lord said, still they don't believe in you. But today what I do, he says, will make them believe in you. Moses had reached Mount Sinai at that time. And the Lord was speaking to him in Exodus chapter 19. He says, what I do today will make them believe that you are really a man of God. I mean, still now they were following him. Maybe they were praising him and saying good things of him. But it was all intellectual. They did not believe it from their heart. I dread to think and I often think that though many people acknowledge me that I'm a servant of the Lord, working for the Lord, etc., the same spirit tells me not everyone believes it from the core of their heart. It's only intellectual. It is only after such experiences as the widow at Zarephath experience. He said, now I've gone through it. Now I know you're definitely a man of God. And really what you speak is the word of God. Till now it was, I knew it. Of course, you'd worked a big miracle for me, flour and oil. But now I really know it. I'm gripped with it. Her faith has finally reached a higher level. And for Elijah himself also, through this sudden misfortune that came, God has taken him to a higher level. And therefore, in the very next chapter, you will see, in chapter 18, he's able to perform a mighty miracle and defeat all the false prophets. But this would never have come if the Lord had not prepared him in this. So you see in the end, even in affliction, the Lord turns it to a good. He's a good God. He has complete control of everything. We will realize it one day when we are in heaven, but right here on earth, faith should suffice. Trust Him. And with this attitude, go ahead in life with this attitude. Let us go ahead in these difficult times which are facing all over the world. Let's hold together in faith. And let us hold together in the Word of God come again and again to go deep into the Word of God 
not the word of brother Edmund, the word of God is what is going to build you up into an Elijah of the present times. Thank you for listening to me. God bless you.